Texas Lutheran University. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, morning session. Um, my name is Mike Zucker. I'm in the psychology department here at Texas Lutheran University. And today represents the continuation of our theme, the neurocognition of music and art. I hope you enjoyed the gallery as well. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to, to see some of the artwork, you, you take a chance to do that a little bit later on. Um, last night, we had the good fortune of listening to Dr. Daniel Levitin, New York Times bestselling author of This Is Your Brain on Music. And uh, today, we have several talks and a panel discussion that continue on this year's theme. Um, this morning, I'm very happy to introduce the maestro, Dave, Mares, uh, Dave Mars, who will be sharing some of his thoughts about last night's talk, as well as those, his own insights about music and how it impacts all of us. Mars began his professional career playing solo horn for the elite US Army Band in Washington, DC. Following his military service, he became associate principal horn of the Pittsburgh Symphony, solo horn of the Pittsburgh Opera and Ballet, and a member of the new Pittsburgh Quintet Brass Ensemble. Mars' interest in conducting led him to the Flint Symphony, where he served as assistant conductor and music administrator. He moved to the San Antonio Symphony in 1988, where he served as resident conductor until 1999, directing classical concerts, audience-pleasing pops, and educational and family concerts. He also hosted the weekly Symphony Spotlight on KPAC Radio. Mars has conducted leading orchestra around the country, including Houston, Dallas, Colorado Springs, Dayton, Saginaw Bay, Phoenix, Charlotte, West Shore, Kansas City, and Fort Worth. And he's an annual guest conductor with the Flint Symphony. Mars has been a leading Texas music educator for over 35 years and was named Denton ISD's 2010 Teacher of the Year and frequently directs the Austin Symphony educational and family concerts. He served as a conductor of, of orchestras at UTSA, music and administrative director, uh, and has been a uh, music and administrative director of the Northeast School of the Arts, and music director of the Youth Orchestra of San Antonio. Mars has led sessions of the League of American Orchestras Conductors Workshop, designed to teach up and coming conductors their craft. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in music from the University of Michigan, master's of divinity degree from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Please help me give a warm welcome to the maestro, Dave Mars. Thank you, good morning. <clears throat> the uh, request or the invitation that came to me was, would you do a response to uh, Dan Levitin's book? And my first thought was, geez, what a great honor. And my second thought was of total intimidation, <laughs> especially as I you know, read about the author and then started into one of his books and then actually got into uh, the book, This Is Your Brain on Music. And um, I do have a little voice that's 60 some odd years old. It's, sits on the, my shoulder, and it has uh, forever. Um, and it comes to me in the most inopportune times with beautiful sayings like, you can't do this. What do you think, who do you think you are? You're gonna be able to do that? You can't do that. That's impossible for you. And so it raises all kinds of um, uh, questions like, ooh, what if I say the wrong thing? And it reminded me of a story of a, a wonderful professor of sociology. Uh, um, his name is Anthony Campola. Tony Campola, for years, was a, pre, a professor of sociology at Eastern College in St. David's, PA. And he was also, um, he was also a, a pastor or a preacher. Preacher would be the word. And he tells a story uh, about uh, being asked to come to a um, a church, a Presbyterian church, and be one of the, and participate in the um, their worship service on Mother's Day, and they slotted him for the 8 a.m. service, and he was just to do the morning prayer. But he confessed that he said, 
quite frankly, I had been out quite a bit later than a man of God should have been out and was a little lacking in sleep and staggered into the church. And all he had to do basically was, um, you know, do a morning prayer and then end up with the Lord's Prayer. And so he thought, I can, I can do this. And so he started his prayer. And, um, and then he came to that spot, which some of you would know, uh, because it's fairly universal, and we pray all these things in the name of the one. And then, and he said that, and then he said, I heard myself, and say, instead of saying, our Father who art in heaven, I heard myself saying, now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> and it wasn't, so uh, I, I've heard that story and laughed and laughed and laughed and just thought, ooh, what's the right thing? And so I... Um, I, I, came, I came back to that word that they asked, a, a response. And um, so I hope that you won't mind that it's pretty personal for who I am and what, what I'm about and my limitations, you know, my interests, and also my, the opportunities that I have. Um, first, I, I really enjoyed last night. I, I see a lot of faces, so I know you were there. I just thought that Dr. Levinson did a fantastic job um, because he was really there for you. I mean, he just talking about his experience and relating to you. And I think if you had a good time, that's, that's partly to blame. I wondered if you noticed how many rock bands that he was in. How many rock bands? Four, five, six? And of course, the underlying message, I, I'm sure if you asked him, was he immediately put us at ease because every one of those rock bands were failures, right? Every one, you know. Um, and I think that's really important as we talk about this beautiful gift of music uh, to learn from what Dan did, and that's just, how did he get us to set it at ease? I, I thought it was like within the first three or four minutes talking about his failures. I really appreciated that. Um, the thing that struck me about the book, two things, um, one or two things. First of all, the book was way much, if you've read it, if you haven't, do. Um, it's way more about than just information about the brain. And the thing that I appreciated so much is that he went, when he talked about the development of the, the, the theory, the different theories, he would... He gave us information about, well, this person, this professor did this research and got this theory, and then along came somebody else and they, they proved, disproved that theory and said, no, this is what. So we, he got both sides, and we always had the, I always got the feeling that he was allowing us into this maybe non-dualistic thinking. Um, that it's not just either this is right, so no, that's wrong now, this is right, no, that's right now, so this is wrong, this either or thing. Um, and to me that speaks of process, and I hope you don't mind, but that's, uh, I, I want to zoom in in the few minutes that I have about that, because it seems to me that process is really important. Music is, is a mystery in many ways. Um, I noticed in the book that there's a comment by Sting. And uh, the comment is, the more we find out about music, the more there is to know, leaving music, leaving its power and mystery intact. So um, this whole opportunity for us to not go right or wrong, but to include the process and the fact that there there were many options and that we maybe, it seemed like Dan was embracing so many or all, as many of the options as he, as he brought up and that knew that it's just an opportunity to consider all the options and we can learn and need to learn to operate in that tension of the mystery and, uh, and the, um, the ambiguity sometimes. So, Pretty much, it's all about the music. And I, I would uh, ask that you'd allow me to just respond 
maybe in three things. First of all, as a, um, as a conductor, because that's what I do. Um, and I want to suggest that with his help, and um, I was reminded that as a conductor, it's all about them. It's all about them. It may be all about the music, yes. It's always about the music. But as a conductor, my job is to remember that it's all about them. Um, as a conductor chooses the music, and um, Dan and I had a conversation, he asked me, so how much music and how much new music you do? Um, and I said, a little. And it made me think about, well, why don't we do more? I mean, we're living in the 20, 21st century. And he, I appreciated his understanding the fact that in an orchestra such as ours, fully professional, yes, but limited in financial resources and time, we basically put on a concert on Sunday afternoon, having met for the first time on Saturday morning for two and a half hours, go get a break, meet for a second rehearsal on Saturday afternoon for two hours, and then come back on Sunday from 12.15 to 2.45 and rehearse for the third time, take a break and do the concert at four o'clock. Um, most orchestras, the big orchestras, have a minimum of four and usually five rehearsals. That makes a big difference. So what do you do? The key in, in one of the keys for me is what do I do and how can I do it knowing that I've got three rehearsals, not four or five, and if you're a really important maestro, which I'm not, you might demand a six if you're doing a baby, three rehearsals, so what can you do? And one of the tensions is how do we, how do we celebrate the music of the present when we know that it's new, it's different, um, and those of you who talked, you don't wanna do something that's too easy because our brains don't, you know, after a while it's like, phew, when do we go out to, for the hot dogs? You know what I mean? Or too difficult, because new music eats time, rehearsal time. And so that's always part of the tension of figuring out it's about them. It's about the audience and what we can offer them, but uh, within the scope and restrictions of budget and time. Um, and it is something, I think, that can be said you know, great music floats to the top. That's one of the reasons why it's easy to perform music of the masters, you know, and in our, in our genre from, you know, from Bach or maybe sometimes pre-Bach all the way up through for sure, the early 20th century and Stravinsky, the known masters, and then, you know, the, I won't say the exception, but the select few, um, uh, from the 20th century and now into the 21st century. Um, in the old music, the, um, the cream comes to the top. Um, so how many of you have ever heard Tchaikovsky's first symphony? Good, um, um, yes, you probably played it. But you don't usually, most people don't know it. They might have heard two. And they've certainly heard, if you're interested in orchestral music, you probably heard four, five, and six. Why? Because one and three, eh, they don't stand up. It's just like Dan was talking about Mozart's early symphonies. So the good music, uh, there's great music out there, and we are blessed to um, have a great library of great music at our disposal. And the more opportunities uh, that we have to explore music of the late 20th, middle, late 20th century and 21st century within those time constraints, because it's all about, we can talk about, it's all about the music, it's all about them, and the them becomes important. At least to me it becomes important. Because for me as a conductor, who are the thems? There's two, there's two groups. Obviously, there's the audience. It's about them, number one. 
and we could talk a little bit about that. Um, actually, I will. <laughs> um, it's about the audience. And with the information that we have, we know that um, we have the potential, I guess you could say, remember the word he used, it's about goosebumps? Um, let me get a reaction. So when you heard that, was goosebumps an exciting, how many, for, for how many was the word goosebumps a positive, exciting term? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, was there, were any of you intimidated by the word goosebumps? How do you create goosebumps? How do you do it? Well, Dan's theory is that there are, there are ways in the, in the hearing, and it goes to here, and then it goes to there. And if you don't have too much wax in your ear, it gets to the right place. And there's a section in the book that talks about there's a special situation, I think, um, where some music or some things you hear go not right to the main place, that reception parlor there that sends it all out, but directly to the a part of the cerebellum. As I recall, I was listening to the book again, this time on my way down uh, from Denton, and I happened to be in a moment of genius the night before, got up at two in the morning and said, I wonder if this is also on audiobook. And I found it. So I had six and a half hours on an excruciatingly long trip uh, from Denton down here because of you know, several car accidents and stuff, but six and a half hours and just me and the road and Dan. So I do remember that. How do you, how do you get that? Well, um, we know that music has this ability maybe to create goosebumps because it does something with memory. And he talked about, he talked about memory. Now, um, one of my main roles, um, Quite frankly, I'm not terribly comfortable with the term maestro, because I've been a number two all my life. And so for decades, anytime I heard the word maestro, um, they were talking about somebody else. And so I never responded. And then also, way back in my history, I played professionally in an orchestra. And when the orchestra musicians used to talk about the maestro, it was a term of derision <laughs> and degradation. So um, um, one, of my, one of my main jobs is to serve as Nana and uh, a Papa and Nana team for my grandkids. And when he was talking about music and memory, I, it just struck me. And I, I think it's really important. Um, so we just came back from eight weeks in England and um, um, Rowan Joseph Morris Lee was born over there to our younger daughter, lives in, and um, so that's the second grandson over there. And uh, Beth, my wife, was over there uh, when Stephen was born four years ago, and she was helping out, and so she used to rock, give Sari a break, and rock, and Beth would sing quietly. And in her wisdom, she's definitely the smarter of the two of us, um, she thought, I'm going to sing Brahms to him. So she would rock and she would sing, pardon my voice, my dear little Stephen, my dear little Stephen Slee, which those of you who've studied musicology or played in orchestra know that that is the main theme of the last movement of Brahms' first symphony. Okay, my dear little Stephen, little Stephen, I can just see her walking around. Well, she came home because I had to join her and she said it was so interesting. She was there for two or three weeks and one day she was, um, he was inconsolable and so she started singing it. But she had a cold and she couldn't get through it. He started to calm down, and she had her iPad there, thank God for the technology, and she was fiddling and happened to come across 
a, she pressed YouTube, looked up Brahms 1, and there on the screen was the Berlin Philharmonic and Sir Simon Rattle. And, and so she pressed it. And it starts. Right, be da di da da. And for three minutes, this beautiful rendition by the Berlin Philharmonic and Sir Simon Rattle just, and he's in a motor, so he's barely conducting. You think, where is he? Where is he? He's somewhere. Maybe he's getting goosebumps. <laughs> he was absolutely silent almost the minute it came on. And by the time and he stayed awake all three minutes and then went to sleep. Two years later, now we're in Denton and there in Manchester, and we're now Skyping. And um, he's, um, he said, uh, Nana, Nana, my do, my do, sing my do. Now in baby talk, that's my dear, my dear little Stephen. And any time we go over, Nana, it's never Papa, Nana, <laughs> Nana, you know, go to the TV, and now he's four, so he can say it more. But my dear, my dear, and if you put the Berlin Philharmonic on, that video thing, he'll stand there like this. So memory, what does it do for him? I'm not sure. But the memory part is so important. Um, and I have other things, but I'm also talking too much. Um, things like that give us a chance to say, the music can do the trick. Because there's something in there. And now we know that our brains enable us to have the memories, whether it's um, from far away, my mother-in-law heard uh, a number of years ago was in San Antonio and we were doing a big band concert. And we happened to have a wonderful singing group who's coming to our concert in February, a big band concert. And they sang Sentimental Journey, the Les Brown arrangement. Those of you, there aren't too many of you who are, uh, might remember because I'm the oldest one here, it looks like. But anyway, Doris Day made it famous. And when the lady started singing, my mother-in-law is up in the balcony. And she starts sobbing, and her health wasn't great anyway, but she starts quietly sobbing, and Beth looks over and thinks, oh my word, she having a heart attack, what happened? And she calmed down, and after the song, we played a fast version, fast tune, and then intermission, and Beth looked over and says, Mom, you're all right. And she said, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. She says, what happened, Beth said, and she said, you don't understand. Sentimental Journey was the first song that your father and I danced to after he came home from the war, having been a prisoner of war for a year. Sentimental journey. The memory, I mean, it's so fantastic. So what do we, what do we do? What's, what's our role? And so I'm going to condense, because I, um, I want to talk about what we can do what I can do and need to do as a conductor, and what you, those of you who can do who are, are here in music as teachers. And part of that is the process. It's all about the process, as far as I'm concerned. And he, um, there's so many things, but um, we talked about Dan's failing. Failing forward is part of the process. It's all part of the process, how you're, um, Recognizing that and allowing your students, my, the musicians that I have the privilege of working with, allowing them to fail and that it's okay. It's part of the process. Um, and essentially, there are definitely things, because we know the power of music, uh, a lot of the responsibility for me, and I encourage for you, as music educators, now potential music educators, you have such a wonderful faculty, watch them, they're already doing it. But is to create an environment for your musicians, for your students, an environment that is so self, is so respectful of them as people first with stories and memories and histories, and also skilled, 
they've done the 10,000 hours. By the way, um, how many of you have been in your high school marching band? Okay, so there's 5,000 hours already, right? <laughs> right, you're halfway there, right? Yeah, but 10,000 hours, it takes so much. But creating environment, that's at least one thing that I can do. Can I um, create a process, an environment in which um, it's, it is about the music, but it's not, well, one story, and, and I think this sums it up. I, had a great, I have a great friend, Michael Coomer. He used to be the um, dean of the School of Music at Duquesne University. And um, I had a band director in college, as well as my dad, both wonderful musicians, but they were abusive, okay? And so we used to go back and forth about it, what, what's more important? Is the concert, that finished product, the most important thing? Back in the olden days, 40, 50, 60 years ago, that was it. It's the concert. And however you could get there, that was the most important. And so the pro product, the process, the ends and means, what it, what's the balance? And we'd hassled over, because I know I, I saw a lot of my friends humili humiliated by both of those conductors in times of stress when it wasn't going well. Just humiliated, and I thought, I can never do that. I, I just, how could you live with yourself? So I said once in the hall to Michael, I believe, puffed up, I believe that the process is as important as the product. Expecting a amen, brother. And Michael, in his gentle way, looked at me and said, David, I don't agree with you. And I, I was stunned. And I said, so what is it to you? And he said, I believe the process is the product. And I, that didn't, I said, can I go home and think about that? Can I come back? <laughs> it was just like new. It shouldn't have been, but it was like new. And the more I thought about it, I realized that's it. If we can create the product, the, the overall product of music, or really anything you're trying to teach, or really anybody you're trying to influence, like Stephen, you know, who's looking at me as Papa or Nana, if the pro we have a product, we have music, we have whatever, great knowledge, uh, teaching, if the process is respectful and kind and helpful, then maybe not in the short term sometimes, but in the long term, the product will be there. One of the things that Dan says in his book is that a, a neurologically there are definite correlations between um, music that comes through as danger signaling or comfort. There are situations where the, the, the brain reacts differently when you have to play for somebody you hate or you like. And that, to me, is where it is. Can we, as educators, as conductors, as musicians who will teach or do whatever, can we create an environment where the people that we have been entrusted with, with whom we've been entrusted, can, can perform to the max. And I'll close with this. Um, there is, there is a, um, there's a German word, and it's called Grenzbegriff. And I'd never heard it before until about a year ago, and somebody was talking about, uh, this is a word that the Germans use to describe something special that happens, but you can't put, you're just not sure what it is. Have you ever been in that situation? And for us musicians where sometimes, you know, you get done, you've been to a concert, but even as a, an ensemble, you get done and it's like, whoa, what was that? You know what I mean? It's like. Oh, have you ever come out of a concert thinking, oh my word, 
or I can't speak. What, what, what was that? And Grensby Griff, is the, that's the word. I'm hoping and praying that sometime when, a, when I great, meet the great author, he'll say, Dave, Grensby Griff means goosebumps. <laughs> you know, or something like that. that. That feeling, it doesn't come often. But we have, as a conductor, as an educator, in what, actually whatever you do, if you're into education and teaching and motivating and molding, we have the opportunity to create an environment of respect and kindness. Somebody said demanding, but never demeaning. We have the opportunity to create that environment where the person with whom we're working can feel at their absolute maximum with all the things that are going on in their brain to perform at their very highest peak. And sometimes, at least in an orchestra, when you have 60 to 70 to 80 people who are doing that, and, uh, and he talks about a groove, and you get the groove. You don't plan to get a groove. You pray that you can get there, and it doesn't always happen. But when it, it does, it's like, oh my, something very special. Things go on in the brain that we now know through his research and others that, that really do things. Did you get it? At the end, he said, listening to music does as much for your circulatory system. Did you hear as much as, what was it, as statins? Everybody and their dog is on. They just put me on statins because my blood's... Mute, listen to music? I'm going to go home and talk to my doctor about, hey, take me off them. I'm just, if I listen to four hours of great music, will that take care of my... That's what music does. So our opportunity and challenge is how can we help them, either the audience through how we approach, or especially the people with whom we work. How can we... Um, how can we make our process as holistic and kind and respectful so that they can to be at their max to, to, to express their creativity and their talent and their vision of the music to create Grenzbegriff or Goosebumps or whatever. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.